we'll start. Um, uh, good afternoon. I'm uh, Don Sherling. I'm a, a psychologist who works at Berkshire Medical Center in Western Mass. Um, and um, I'm really pleased to be here today. I wanted to thank C4 and D and um, Susan and Jen and all the volunteers and sponsors and exhibitors for making this conference possible. Um, I've taught here before, but it's really a, one of the better conferences to, um, to get uh, good new information and some cutting edge stuff. So I, I hope to, um, to really do some mind bending things with you today to, to help you guys uh, begin to make a shift that's occurring rapidly in healthcare because of costs and that of sick care. Uh, we're beginning to try and shift um, over into prevention and wellness care, and this is about that. Um, so I'm going to give, uh, give you a lot of information. We're going to do it from higher altitude, though, than, um, than uh, Dr. Um, uh, who is the doctor this morning? Um, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, Simpson, 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 Dr. Simpson, yeah. Uh, so Dr. Simpson did an incredible job this morning uh, describing some things, a little bit about behavioral epigenetics and, and things. And so we're going to just highlight some of these things. Um, um, so here we go. Um, I'm very indebted uh, to my colleague, um, Dr. Mark Pettis, who's um, at Berkshire Medical Center. He's uh, been involved a lot with... Um, with uh, non-traditional medicine and uh, many other things cutting edge, but he's really good in traditional medicine as well, but he's helping us. And we've, um, Berkshire Medical Center has joined with Canyon Ranch Institute, uh, not the spa, although it's related to the, uh, the, the spas in Tucson and Lenox, Mass. But um, we've joined them in, the Institute is a not-for-profit trying to bring insights from Canyon Ranch and wellness into um, the community. And we're, we're now doing our ninth um, community group um, with, um, with about 20 people at a time, and we educate them about their wellness and try to increase their health literacy and their advocacy for themselves with their own physicians and caretakers. And these are people that are really, really challenged, most by five to six chronic conditions, diabetes, obesity, and many other things that are, that are really, really uh, destructive in their lives. And um, an incredible cost savings is beginning to incur because the people are, are hospitalized much less. Um, the first program they, they opened up, I'm doing a little <laughs> promotion here. I just said I don't have any relationships, but they aren't paying me to do this. But, um, but um, the first one they opened in the Bronx, New York, actually they found that it's been going about 10 years now. They save about $5,000 a year per person that goes through this program with acute care savings and stuff. So that, so, okay, so, um, what did we once know that turned out not to be so? Um, it, when my dad was in uh, World War II, they used to issue non-filtered cigarettes to the soldiers and uh, airmen. And um, he um, was, by the time he got uh, through with uh, the Army after World War II, he was smoking four packs a day of non-filtered cigarettes. And, um, and he and I are exactly 30 years and one month apart. He's now 95. When I was about one year old, he stopped smoking. And, um, but he's still got some scar tissue that his doctors can see from that uh, period, but his body has really transformed itself back into uh, pretty remarkable health. And there's an incredible resiliency uh, that can occur with lifestyle change. Uh, what else do we know that, that isn't necessarily so? Um, sometimes people say, your doctor tells you if, you, if you live long enough, you're gonna get hypertension. It's just one of the things of growing old. This is not so. Um, so, uh, cultures that uh, do not add salt to their diet um, do not get hypertension as they age. Uh, whereas all the, w the Western cultures that, um, that do add salt to their diet um, tends to get incredible spikes in hypertension. Um, just that one different factor. Um, I, I forgot to, to do a thing with you that I wanted to do to set the paradigm shift that I'm talking about today. So if you would, pretend you're looking up at a clock face and and trace the hands in a clockwise fashion. Just do it with your, yeah, with your hand, like in a clockwise fashion, like looking up at a clock. Now just keep moving it in the same direction and bring it down to chest level. Now which direction are you going? You're going counterclockwise now from down here. Well, some, some, it usually works that way, <laughs> yeah. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a mind-bending thing, <laughs> so that's what I wanted to. 
Um, so why prevention and wellness? Um, we can't afford the cost anymore of sick care um, because uh, most of the dollars are spent in the last a few months of life. And um, in 2007, which is now a, a while ago, about nine years ago, we were spending 1.7 trillion. It keeps rising every year. 75 to 80 percent of our health care dollars go to chronic conditions. Um, and uh, people, we can't uh, support that. Um, this is some statistics. I'm not going to go through all of this because you guys know most of this. Just, just to let you know, 50% of Americans are either diabetic or pre-diabetic at this point. That, that's really mind-bending. And then this uh, millions of cases of diabetes in 2000 and projections for 2030 in almost all areas of the world, um, it's supposed to either double or, or even more than that, uh, with a few exceptions. Um, so. We're going to have so many cases of uh, diabetes, and uh, the health care um, costs are great, and the, the health costs are, are huge with uh, cardiac problems and all kinds of other uh, issues that come with diabetes. Uh, globally, by 2020, less than 20 million deaths will be from infectious disease. Uh, we've wiped out from infectious disease in some parts of the world now, uh, more than 50 million from chronic disease. Uh, so the bad news is, we can't afford to take care of ourselves anymore with these chronic conditions. But the good news is we're designed to heal ourselves if we can link uh, together our genetic, um, epigenetic uh, book of life, if you will, and our lifestyle so that they fit together. Uh, this is a courtesy of Dr. Dean Ornish, the great cardiac researcher and doctor who researched into diet. And this is our health care. We're scrubbing up. Uh, pedal, but not turning off the water in, uh, in the sink. Uh, I like this one, too. Um, a part of my own um, uh, awareness and, uh, and try to promote wellness now is I try to do much more with my body and uh, to be aware of things. And, you know, we're in, this, in the U.S., we're kind of enamored with cognitive therapies. And um, uh, some people have poked fun now at cognitive therapies, the great Cog Scott Miller and others. <laughs> um, and um, we, we've gotten too much into into thinking our way into health and we're not succeeding, we have to get the body back involved. We have to live in our bodies because that's all the only vessel we have uh, to live in. And so this um, workshop, some about that. So what is it about our bodies that isn't working anymore for us? We have an ancestral uh, book of life um, that um, really uh, isn't working. Um, we're moving toward uh, personalized. There's boutique medical practices now that actually uh, really individualize care and do designs if you have significant amounts of money to do that. The billionaire class uh, lives that way with their medicine. Uh, the rest of us can't afford that. Uh, we also are changing the scientific method because of big data. It used to be that we'd have to um, wait 10 years to find out if Prozac was harmful for pregnant uh, women's fetuses, and now we can uh, just research that based on electronic health records. We're getting more and more data with tracking devices that everybody has on, so we can look at that, how many pe women are actually taking uh, an antidepressant with, uh, during pregnancy, and we can take that data and almost immediately assign risk and benefit. Um, that's a, an amazing thing that we can do. And then we, um, we're looking more at population research where we're actually our reimbursement's going to be tied to, you take care of this group of people, this 100,000 people in your catchment area, and uh, you can leave them all in treatment 100% of the time if you want, but you, you have this much money to spend and that's how you're going to have to, that's what you're gonna get. So uh, how are we going to do that if we take 80% of our, our care on 10% of the population? So. Um, and then micro, individualized research with the data, we have a, now an N of one. So you can actually look at uh, genetic material, lifestyle material, all kinds of lab tests, and you can hone that down into a very specific strategy uh, for your own health care. They're doing that now with cancer. They have certain genetic testing that they can actually code which of the poisons that they give in chemotherapy will work the best on this particular tumor in this particular person uh, based on their genetics. And uh, it's moving really at a mind-bending uh, rate at this point. And uh, we're beginning to relearn what the ancients and many other cultures have remembered and still do, food is medicine. So what's the big picture? I'm going to uh, talk to you a little bit, uh, give you an introduction to epigenetics. Um, 
uh, talk about metabolism, and we've been uh, really misguided on metabolism with no fats and low fat um, uh, things, and um, the amount of carbohydrates, complex carbohydrates, especially glucose and fructose, um, are incredible. Uh, if I told you the amounts of uh, sugar you're, <laughs> you're eating uh, when you go to break <laughs> every day, it's just really mind-bending uh, that our bodies can even manage that at all. And uh, sometimes we hear of people drinking two liters of soda um, you know, a day. Um, I had a pregnant woman one time who was uh, in recovery, but uh, she was drinking two and a half liters of soda a day or more, and she was pregnant, and um, that's all she drank. She didn't drink water. She didn't <laughs> like water. And uh, it's a really pretty uh, severe uh, thing, effect on metabolism. Um, inflammation, we've now known that this is a, a, a very huge marker for uh, disasters in health if you have inflammation. We used to think, well, it wasn't so important. Dental hygiene, you know, was nice. Uh, if you floss in that, nice, you have cleaner teeth. But actually, if you get gingivitis, it can set off a chain reaction of um, inflammation in your body and really, really destroy your health um, with uh, blood pressure and all kinds of other things. And obesity and sugar are two huge uh, inflammatory triggers um, in the body. The gut microbiome barrier function, um, a, a good part of our immune system is actually um, the bacterial in our bodies. I'll say more about that. Um, we are exposed to environmental toxins at a massive level. Uh, the little um, molecular structures in our cells, every cell in our body has a mitochondria. They convert um, um, food and, and, and products and oxygen into energy. And uh, if those, those get damaged by toxins and that sort of thing, it really does affect our health negatively. Um, it was mentioned this morning, allostasis, um, the interactions we have with the amount of stress in our lives and the stress load we carry in our bodies and how do we manage all that stress because uh, much of it comes from mental stress. It's not really life-threatening stress, but our bodies don't know that and our bodies treat it and we're turned on to fight flight 24-7 almost all the time with disastrous consequences for our health. And then social connection and health, um, uh, we used to um, not care so much. We'd often send people in early recovery into um, halfway houses or residential programs, but then we'd send them out from those into where? Into a rooming house where they, all they had was a, a TV and a box and a mattress on the floor. With that isolation comes disastrous emotional disconnection and pain, and um, that um, is really destructive to one's health, the isolation. And then finally, spiritual practice does really affect uh, one's health directly. Uh, so how do we um, do this? Uh, the last 10 years, um, our genetic um, uh, knowledge has doubled. Uh, epigenetic uh, research has doubled in the last three to four years. The microbiome, the bacteria that live in us and on us, um, is now uh, doubling every 12 to 18 months, just the knowledge from that. Um, so we're, we're beginning to see that you aren't stuck with your book of life as, is, as, as if you can't ever rewrite it. The, the genome is pretty, pretty stable, uh, but there's many, many ways in which the epigenetics, which is the, the way that's packaged, um, I'll say a little bit more about that in a bit, uh, can turn off and turn on certain gene sequences and uh, can really dramatically affect uh, your health. Um, and we're going from sick care to uh, population health and that. So nature via nurture. So there were these two um, mice uh, sitting in a bar drinking, um, uh, and uh, one was a mother mouse and her middle-aged son, alcoholic mouse. And uh, Freud and Darwin both walked into the room, and um, so the mother mouse said, you geniuses, tell me, how did my son get into such a sick state? Sorry, state. And Darwin said, bad inheritance, and uh, Freud said, bad mothering. <laughs> So it, it, it's probably both, though. So we, we're now seeing that we kind of live in this um, space. Our lives are in this place between epigenome, microbiome, our environment, and environment including all of our relationships and friends and the contextual uh, areas that we live. Um, so how do we begin to proactively create health uh, where we um, are headed for very bad things? So complex individual. Um, I've mostly said all of this already, so I'm just going to move through this. Um, I'm including some slides in here I'm not going to focus on just for your own benefit, and you can look up references and that sort of thing. 
So um, up until now, we've mostly looked at um, these long latency diseases, these chronic conditions. We've been looking at the leaves of the plant. And so we can see if they yellow or if they get spots on them or something, and we try to treat that. Uh, sometimes put spray on it or <laughs> something like that, or give it a, some kind of pharmaceutical medicine to try and fix it. Uh, but we haven't looked as much at the stem. Um, what is driving some of these imbalances and how are they distributed in the body? And we certainly haven't been looking at root causes, kind of the sink spilling over, we're scrubbing up water but not turning off the faucet. So um, how do we move through that? There's a lot of words in here, um, but um, mainly um, these chronic conditions that, uh, that are really pretty universal uh, in our societies now, especially modern societies where we eat manufactured, a lot of manufactured food and that sort of thing. And our core metabolic things gets completely out of balance. And uh, the stress and, uh, and all of that is out of balance. And then uh, we are needing to get back to some of these basic self-care and caretaking things. My whole practice has changed since I've been involved in, in this. Uh, when I do psychotherapy now, I'm less likely to talk about cognitive interventions for a patient and much more likely to talk to the person about breathing and teach them some breathing exercises and talk to them about sleep and talk to them about the amount of sugar they take in, the amount of caffeine, and certainly other substances, and uh, try to help them with some basic things. Because I've seen many, many people that I was able to coach them on sleep hygiene and, and fix their sleep patterns, and they didn't need psychotherapy. They didn't need, and their depression lifted, and their anxiety was, uh, was mitigated. They weren't without anxiety, but it was mitigated by just restoring sleep to their bodies. When we have a, a psychotic or a bipolar patient come in in a mania into the hospital now, our biggest concern is sleep, to restore their sleep. Uh, their brains cannot heal uh, from those conditions without sleep. And um, also, if you don't sleep much, um, it seems counterintuitive. You'd think you'd burn more energy, but your body reacts to that stress uh, by storing more fat and preparing for lean times. And um, that's part of our ancient microbiome. So without sleep, you're really messed up in terms of trying to lose weight. Um, so with that stress, and if you actually go away for the weekend, you eat like a king but sleep a lot, you probably will lose weight <laughs> rather than gain weight than if you run your, your heart out in aerobic exercise and then don't sleep much. Uh, it's a bad trade-off. So. so what are the conditions of your soil? Is there something you're getting too much of? Um, hint, sugar, <laughs> um, maybe some other things. Uh, is there something you need more of? Um, hint, uh, probably some healthy fats, uh, more plant material and, and, and fiber. Um, and maybe more exercise, and maybe more sleep, um, uh, and maybe more stress management. Um, uh, what would your great-grandparents have done when confronting the, the concern or the stressor that you have? And many of them, um, even though it seemed as they were kind of backward uh, because of uh, the kind of labor that they put into just their, living their normal lives, uh, there was a lot of secrets back there. And there's a lot of, uh, actually, the, their, their heritage comes through in our epigenetic uh, inheritance. You can actually now track. You can actually track people's um, um, problems sometimes, mental health problems and that sort of thing, to stressful events in the in their grandparents' past. So if your grandparent um, was um, an alcoholic, or if your grandmother went through the depression and was really stressed out and depressed like that, that can be transmitted in the epigenome by both nature and nurture. So it gets, there are certain genetic things get turned on and off, and there are certain uh, amounts of um, stress comes in with, with nurturing and the quality of that relationship. So my doctor told me I'm feeling poorly because I'm getting old. Um, we um, don't think that that's uh, such a good uh, advice anymore, although I like it when, uh, when you go to the doctor and, or you do a wellness test and it says, well, your age is, counts against you. <laughs> well, of course, uh, because uh, like uh, Bill Clinton said, um, he's got more, more days behind him than ahead of him. And uh, at some point, that kind of starts registering in your mind, and you start thinking about um, the limitations of life. But we've now are finding that uh, with addressing these lifestyle issues, that often you can have much more of a rectangular uh, uh, thing in the box. So it's like Brian Adams, the song, writer says, uh, I want to be 18 till I die. And so you, <laughs> you try to, to live that out so you don't have this steady decline with chronic illness. Um, and that's um, the ideal. 
So health is a byproduct of gene environment compatibility. So I have this caveman, probably from the Allstate commercial or whichever one that was, with McDonald's. So, um, so these three main things are, um, are what we've found out a lot about. This is where the explosion of knowledge is coming, a lot from animal studies, which we already knew, sort of, but now it's being confirmed. Uh, because we have a way to look at the brain, even a working brain. We have a way of looking at systems in the body that confirm uh, how much it's bad to have constant stress and stress hormones flowing in your body, how damaging that is to a nervous system. Um, and uh, reward response, how enticing it is to solve that with a pill or a drink or something like that, and how that's actually survival-oriented. It actually is uh, instinctually right to solve that, to get that stress out of your body. And that, but then when the actual, the substances actually work to do that, or the sugars or whatever, uh, then it gets very rewarding and even unconscious. Um, I can speak for myself, I, um, I love sugar and uh, have always. We were fairly poor. I grew up in the Midwest on a farm. We didn't have much, but we ate like kings because we raised our own food, huge garden and everything. And my mother treated us with dessert after every meal. And even today, I can go to the finest restaurant in the country and eat the best meal I've ever had and be satiated completely. I'm still looking for sugar. And I'll grab something on the way out of the door, less and less so, because I'm getting it solved. But it's quite amazing to me. It, it's an unconscious thing. I find myself just looking <laughs> around the house for something sweet. Uh, it's just a deep pattern. And then attachment and bonding. Um, I've already said quite a bit about that, but um, a critical thing for mammals. If you isolate a mammal, other than Zen Buddhist monks who choose that, um, it, this is really not very good for our, our bodies and uh, adds a lot of stress. And in act actually, um, my boss has talked a lot about this when his daughters, who are now adults, when he'd come home from a really stressful day, used to work at McLean Hospital and then BMC, and his, his daughters were toddler age, um, he could spend 15 minutes with them wrestling on the floor, and that would set off the oxytocin in his body and theirs, and, um, and he would be calmed down. Um, a better, much better oxytocin, <laughs> better than Valium or Xanax or anything like that, and, and pretty natural. I'm wondering if we can synthesize that, but um, some of us would probably misuse it. <laughs> but, but, um, but that's why little, little mammals sleep in piles, um, and that, that's why... Um, uh, just a quick um, word about that. They, they did some studies when they first were j discovering about epigenetics early in the early 90s and then into the early 2000s. Uh, they did a lot of studies with rodents. And so uh, poor rats and mice, they get, <laughs> they get a lot of uh, things done. But they'd actually look at their brains uh, after they lived their much shorter lives if they were stressed. So they had good mother rats and bad mother rats. Actually, this was on mice initially. And uh, they began to, um, to notice that um, these, uh, the, the mice that had good motherings would, would stay calmer and be healthier throughout their lives. So they began to think about how this works. So they, they switched the good mother's my, mice with the bad mother's mice, and the little ones came out based on the mothering, not the genetic code. The genetic code was similar, but their epigenetic code that was coded in from their mother was carried out was changed by the nurturing that they got or lack thereof. And then they went deeper, and they, they actually knew back in the 50s that if they held little lab mice and, and petted them and, and coddled them about 15 minutes a day, that they stayed healthier and they looked better and they, they were better and they were happier and calmer and less temperamental and less aggressive. And um, so they did that, and they, um, they thought it was the humans handling the little mice. But actually... They found out it wasn't the humans because they had a way to test for that. And they found out the mother mice would get nervous after her babies were held. So she would check them out and nurture them and lick them and, and get them all. And it was her nurturing after they were handled that wasn't the handling, the human handling, but the mother's nurturing. And, um, and then they even went so far as to actually test this out. So they, they got a bunch of little mice that they bullied, uh, male mice that they bullied. And these male mice were really nervous wrecks. And they bred them to calm, wonderful young uh, girl mice. And uh, the babies came out very, very nervous from all these bullied mice. And uh, other mice weren't showing that. And they thought, well, maybe it was because they were exposed to the father. So then they took the father out of the picture. <clears throat> they just um, inseminated the, the mice with the uh, bullied mice's uh, sperm. Same nervousness came out. 
And then they thought, well, that's interesting. So, um, but, but when they, oh no, th th when they did the, the insemination, uh, they actually found out that the mice were not, but they, they thought that first it was because they were exposed to, and then they, they eventually found out a way to, to test out, so they, they never exposed. Oh, they thought the mother mouse was affected by the, by the other mouse, but even if they didn't, if they inseminated the mother mouse and she still had nervous pups uh, or baby mice, um, that they uh, thought that it was because the father mouse had influenced that, but it actually wasn't epigenetic at that point. It was because the mother mouse, they figured out, the mother mouse knew that she had been bred to an inferior mouse, and so she didn't do as well at nurturing these little mice. Uh, Interesting stuff. So. Okay, so how do we live in harmony with our genes? Um, this may be true for us, uh, for the polar bears soon <laughs> with climate change, but we want to make sure that we um, uh, tuned in. So just another little uh, piece of interesting data. If you look at um, uh, city-dwelling mammals, uh, like raccoons in this case, uh, raccoons in Philadelphia that live in the city, many, many, many hundreds of them. There's uh, two and three per block in some places. Uh, and they, they eat human waste, uh, not, not poop, but they, they eat uh, garbage cans. And uh, they get into all those, and uh, they're very, very clever. But they're eating, they're eating antibiotics, sugar, manufactured foods, uh, throwaway stuff, pet foods. Um, and they actually have uh, then test tested them, and they, they have an altered microbiome. Their gut bacteria gets changed. And they're actually obese, diabetic, unhealthy, have much shorter lives than the, the raccoons from the same genetic stock that are living out in the woods, uh, much thinner, much healthier raccoons. So how is this working? Um, so we were uh, designed, and our genetic imperative is uh, we have targeted fight-flight. So if your life is threatened, you need to really, really make a big effort to save your life. So you run like hell or fight or freeze. And, um, and these things are, are really energy. Um, everything's driven into that, because if you don't survive, it doesn't matter if you have an ulcer afterward. <laughs> so um, everything was targeted into that. They had fairly shorter lifespans, but we can now see this in mammals. Uh, they um, will uh, run like heck or something like that to get away, and then they go into a bush and they escape. Uh, they've observed now snowshoe hares after being chased by a lynx or a, or a wolf or something like that. Uh, after they, they're certain that the, the predators moved on, they do that, and then they go back to being their happy-go-lucky rabbit. Um, uh, it, they shake that out of their, their bodies, and um, there's a new resiliency program now that a couple of women, have, um, Leitch and Karis, have developed where they take this, um, some of these ideas on resiliency from mammal studies and other things and, and human uh, testing. They take it now into places like the earthquake zones and stuff like that, and they teach whole communities resiliency methods that, um, that explain to them parasympathetic, sympathetic interactions, and they teach them how to do some rituals of letting go of things and um, self-soothing and some breathing exercises, and uh, they're finding that the PTSD rates go down in those after they get this resiliency training. Just a, a you know, a, a a few hours of resiliency training, and then that becomes part of the tradition of the villages. Um, uh, we're taught after this fight flight, we give it our all, and we, you leave everything like it's, everything's a sprint. There's no distance running in this targeted fight flight thing when you go into a panic state. But then you go into energy conservation. So if you have um, animals that, that we can observe and humans, uh, many times uh, the, the health, some of the healthiest humans, uh, some of the Greek isles, uh, they have a lifestyle where they, uh, people live into their, into their 110s, 120s, some of them, and they actually have a lifestyle where they wake up sort of whenever they want to. But many of them wake up fairly early uh, because they're kind of tied to the light. They garden. They eat really healthy foods. Uh, then they take a long nap, and then they meet with their friends in the afternoon and play games and do stuff. They do another workspace in the evening. Then they hang out with their friends and drink wine and and have all this connection. And, um, and they're living much longer lives because they're, they're, they have this uh, give it your all and then calm down and, and relax. Uh, immunity is affected by some of these things, clotting. Uh, how many of us are on baby aspirin or <laughs> some kind of blood thinner to try and keep from uh, having a, a clot go to our, our brain, our lungs or whatever, our heart? Uh, and how many of us have inflammation in our bodies? There's actually a test for that now. Um, 
uh, we often uh, would encourage people to have your doctor test for uh, the inflammation in your body. Um, and now we have anxiety and fear and all of the bad things I've been talking about. So here's the shape of things to come. <laughs> uh, and uh, we, <laughs> we're going in this direction. <laughs> We're, um, we're getting to the last one there. <laughs> uh, the, here's, a, here's an illustration of that in terms of the genetics and epigenetics. So the Pima Indians in uh, Arizona and Mexico, uh, about 100 years ago, they split populations. And the Mexican Pimas live pretty much traditionally like they did. They're mountainous people. And the uh, Arizona Pimas live in the Western modern culture and eat McDonald's. Uh, prevalence of type 2 diabetes in the Arizona the same genetic code, previous to this split um, are five times higher diabetes uh, in the Arizona Pimas. Um, this is the difference in the, the two cultural groups. So what is epigenetics? Um, this is going to be uh, kind of an overview with some metaphors in it because I am not a geneticist. Um, uh, but Dr. <coughs> is my name again this morning. I, I feel embarrassed that I'm doing this on tape here, but um, our doctor this morning, Simpson, uh, Dr. Simpson talked about it's the wrapping around, so the gene uh, our genome is wrapped around histones, which are proteins, and then around that is uh, there's methyl or non-methyl. Uh, these are uh, kind of uh, different chemicals and proteins that are wrapped around that. And so I, I have some illustration, but let me come back to that. Um, so. Um, these uh, histone tails, um, if you look down here in this little box, um, this pink section is a tightly wrapped or heavily methylated uh, part of that. And sometimes if uh, with stressors or different kinds of things, your genome will, will have typos in it that get turned on and off. And so it doesn't change the underlying genome, but it expresses or transcribes into uh, an action. So when you're, when you're developing uh, as a baby in utero, uh, if you have a, an expression of uh, you ha these, uh, the genome gets affected by if you want lung stem cells from lung to liver to brain to spinal cord, this is all a communication system, all happens biochemically. And um, this can be changed for an individual. I'm going to illustrate that in a bit. Um, but a little bit more on the genome. Uh, the Human Genome Project has really uh, transformed things. We thought that we'd have many more, hundreds of thousands maybe, of different variations in the human genome. There's actually only about 23,000 genes uh, in the human genome. But the variation in genes is far greater than expected, maybe 3 to 10 million single nucleotide polymorphisms. So this is um, different changes. He mentioned it this morning, Dr. Simpson. So um, in the wrappings, which genetic part of that is expressed, which is methylated or turned off. and um, there's some pretty mind-bending stuff about that that's happening. So Dr. Randy Jertle, father of nutritional epigenetics, he pioneered the use of the agouti mouse. The agouti mouse is a mouse that's yellow and obese and uh, has a fairly short life, has diabetes, uh, does, is not a really healthy mouse because they don't have methylation on a part of their genome that, um, that deals with their metabolism. Um, so in one generation, he fed agouti mouse uh, that was bred to an agouti male and agouti female mouse. He fed them uh, maternal supplements with methylating factors, um, zinc, um, uh, choline, folate, B12. And uh, she had, they almost always had normal little mice, gray and healthy little mice. While in utero, just a, I don't know what a gestation for a mouse is, six weeks, maybe four weeks, um, uh, that uh, is changes and it turns off certain genetic coding and, uh, and allows the other mouse to be born. And that mouse stays healthy throughout their life, their life span then. Um, Dr. Dean Ornish again um, had a group of males. Prostate cancer is usually slow growing, so oftentimes is uh, given a choice whether to treat it or not. Uh, but um, so there was a fairly large number of men uh, did a study with him where they decided they weren't going to be treated with chemotherapy, radiation, or surgery, and um, they changed their diet. And he prescribed their diet much more plant and fiber and um, less sugar and uh, some healthy fats. And um, after just three months on the di diet, 
um, 500 plus genes change their expression, their transcription, in this group of uh, men. Um, twin studies um, are quite a different thing. Uh, percentage of twins who share traits. Um, this is uh, fraternal twins versus um, uh, uh, identical twins. Identical twins are the white, and uh, fraternal twins are the gray. Um, and you can see height, mostly some of those. But as you get down toward the chronic diseases, rheumatoid arthritis, stroke, Crohn's disease, breast cancer, multiple sclerosis, diabetes, hypertension in the middle, uh, it's more than double um, uh, in uh, identical twins. Uh, but it does drop off in how they share those. Now, this is really, really mind-bending. So at three years old, the yellow shows where the twins have epigenetic tags in the same place. That's how their genome is wrapped uh, with these um, uh, different uh, proteins. And the, the yellow is three-year-old twins. By the time they're 50 years old, look how little yellow is left in their genomes. This is epigenetic changes in their life, identical twins. Um, that we are also finding out a lot, it was mentioned again this morning, uh, about um, child abuse uh, and, or a really good bonding experience. Um, we know uh, that there are certain um, uh, uh, receptor genes that get turned on with bonding that are not there in a, in, a, in a child that's been abused or neglected. And this is sometimes a lifelong thing, uh, but in individuals it can be affected by lifestyle and uh, changed. Um, and so the stress response goes up uh, with, uh, with abuse, obviously, and the stress response goes way down with this bonding, but you can see it transformed as people get uh, recovery and help. Um, this is an interesting story. I mentioned the Greek islands. Um, this is Starmatis um, Moriatis, age 97. Um, he, he immigrated to the U.S. after World War II and uh, came here in his, I think, his late, early 20s, rather, and uh, lived in this country and worked in this country, I think, in Florida. And um, at 63, he was diagnosed with, uh, with cancer that was already metastasized. And um, so he went back to Greece to live, to, um, uh, to and live his life out. His doctors gave him six months at the most. And uh, he's now 97. This was a few years back. He went back to Florida to kind of check in with the doctors <laughs> to show them. Uh, that he was still alive and they were all dead. So um, <laughs> uh, he, he lived on Icaria, a little island down in this area, and uh, changed his diet. And that was um, all based on going back to an island lifestyle with uh, this kind of food and uh, lots of social contact, uh, good sleep, and good um, connection. So here's the lesson. <laughs> uh, this is the, f the food groups, and uh, juice and it says juice and soda or sugar in the upper right. Uh, uh, there's um, anywhere from uh, 8 to, to 12 uh, teaspoons of sugar in a soda, um, if you start thinking about that. So I, there's this one commercial that we use in our teaching of the health uh, literacy things, and we have a guy comes in and he snorts 19 bags of sugar. <laughs> and this guy sitting next to him is drinking a large soda, a, a liter soda, and he's looking at the guy that's snorting the sugar um, like he's completely crazy, but the, actually the guy drinking the soda is drinking way more sugar, 22 uh, t t teaspoons of sugar instead of 19. <clears throat> so, any questions so far? All right, let's go in. Yeah. The, um, the men that returned to Greece, uh, the... Um what kind of cancer was he diagnosed with? I, I'm not sure. Um, um, so the, the, the science of epigenetics would suggest that you can change all of that cancer just by changing your diet. Um, probably not. It wouldn't be that bold. We have to be really careful with this because um, there are some people who are hypothesizing that this is multi-generational, and it appears that it might be. But um, there's a wide variation of what people are saying at this point, and we, the, the knowledge is exploding. But um, in his case, uh, something changed because he went back to, because he was from that island originally, we think that he tuned into a, a long-time genetic coding that was fit for him, and that lifestyle was fit, maybe more than another person that would try to go move to Greece that wasn't from there originally. 
so he was tuned into that and his genome was settled down and, and uh, modified. The typos in his genome, what was methylated, what wasn't methylated, changed. Same with the Dean Ornish group, the prostate cancer. In just three months, those gene, the genome was changed around. I speak for myself. I um, used to have a pattern, because I like sugar so much, I would gain 30 pounds over three years. Um, and then I'd have a crisis in my life, a divorce in one case, uh, loss of a job. And I lost a lot of weight quickly, like 10 pounds a month or more. And, um, and then I'd be healthy for a while and do, you know, I'd be, I've always been an exerciser, but sleep is not so good for me <laughs> still. But I've actually changed in the last three years. I've been living with a significantly changed diet, uh, much less sugar. I still am not a zealot about it, but completely. But like in the, in the rooms here, I don't eat any of the sugar stuff because it, it will set me off into a, into a tailspin and I'll feel lousy. I won't sleep as well and it just isn't worth it to me anymore. So I'm kind of in there. But I've maintained the same weight now for three years without even trying. Uh, and I still exercise about the same. I don't sleep as much as I should, but I do pretty well most of the time. I'm doing yoga now and stuff, and I don't gain weight. I, it you know, goes up and down three pounds based on water retention or something like that, but not much. And uh, my doctor's jealous of my blood work and always has been, so I've had good genes that way. But um, but the sugar was killing me, and I didn't realize how much that was stressing me out. So, uh, when it comes to sleep, how do you determine how much sleep a um, there's, there's rare exceptions, but most of us need about eight hours. Um, and sometimes my niece has a, has a seizure disorder, and she needs to have nine to ten, but she's got three little kids under age four at this point, so I don't know how she's doing that and working. but. Uh, but, um, but most of us need about eight hours, um, and um, we're, we're, it's, we've got a lot of things against us on that score, especially with the media and stuff. Uh, I suggest you not keep your phone in your room uh, and, um, and uh, get, your t get the TV out of your room and a lot of things, uh, and use, use the bed for just sleep and sex. Yeah? I just went to a recent uh, seminar on sleep, and they actually said that the studies show that people who sleep seven hours a night live longer than people who sleep eight? Yeah. There may be some variation in that. Yeah. We're still learning a lot, so um, but, yeah, fine-tuning it. But I, I'm more, more used to getting four to five, sometimes six. And then even though I may spend that much time in bed, I don't necessarily sleep. Because once I wake up and my brain turns on, I'm pretty much done. But I've, now that I've learned um, some meditation and some yoga, I'm able to stay in bed and not freak out when I'm not sleeping. And um, my, one of my sleep study doc's friends says that that may be just as good as sleep because I meditate. And um, she said you can probably get your brain waves almost equally restful at that point. Can you get too much sleep? Uh, yes, of course, yeah. Yeah, if you, get, uh, if you go much over eight, that typically it backfires, and then you start gaining weight again. It messes up your metabolism in another direction. Maybe that's the study about the seven. <laughs>